So here's the question we're going to be tackling. It is reversing an integer, right? So the interviewer comes to you and says, write some code which can reverse an integer. And that's it. Let's say I was asking you the question and I stop right there, right? I'm not going to give you any more details. What are the first set of questions that come to your mind? I want to address the two questions that have come up in the chat. The first question is, do we have to tackle both sign and unsign integers? The answer is yes. Uh, the second question is, are the numbers distinct? They may or they may not be. The solution should work for both, irrespective of whether the number has each individual digits are distinct or not. What would the approach be? Think about how you would reverse a string. You have, um, actually you don't, you're not using any uh, library, you're reversing the string yourself. What you would do is look at the individual characters, start from the end or start from the beginning, however you wanna do it. Let's say we start from the end, right? So look at the individual characters and then plop it onto the beginning of the reversed string. So you have this thing called the reverse string and then you take one by one, a character one by one and put it in the reverse order. So you essentially have to traverse the string once in, in an individual character level. And then uh, you basically keep adding to the resultant string. Could you do something like that with integers? Well, the problem with that approach is that you don't have a char at concept with integers. There is no single API which lets you pick a number, pick a digit of an integer at a particular position. There is no API to kind of append it as well. So you're gonna have to do that yourself. But since it's integer, all you have to do is just some simple math. So here's how it could it could potentially look like, all right? So let's say uh, I've got this uh, integer, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so this is my integer. Now what I need to do is to create a new integer, which is, let's say this is the reversed. This is going to be my solution. So what I'm gonna need to do is convert this to this guy. Well, we can start out by getting digits one by one and then adding to this, but then multiplying it by that particular position so that it keeps moving further up. So now let me explain. How do I get the first digit over here? Five, four, three, two, one. How do I get the first digit? Well, I just do a reminder by, by dividing by 10. So let's say I do, uh, let's say this is my input. If I were to do input percent 10, what I get is that last digit, which is one. Reversed equals input percent 10. So reversed is now holding on to the value of one. Okay, so now I have got the first digit. How do I get two in there? All right, now can I do input person 10 over here? I cannot do input person 10 anymore because I'm still gonna get one. I cannot do input person 100 anymore because I'm gonna get 21, which is not what I want. However, I can do input equals input divided by 10, all right? So I'm gonna do integer division. And what this is gonna let you do is get that one out, all right? So what is five, four, three, two, one, divided by 10. I'm gonna get five, four, three, two, all right? So, well, now is there a way to do this guy here, which is get the reminder, and then do this guy here, which is basically get rid of that reminder, and maybe do this in a loop? So if you do this in a loop, you basically get each individual digit one by one. All right, so as long as you do this in a loop, you do a reminder divided by 10, and then actually divide by 10 and replace input with that divided value, you essentially have this loop structure where you can loop over all the individual digits and you get a digit one by one. Okay, so that's gonna solve the problem of getting individual digits. Now the second problem is, how do you put it into this reversed string? All right, in order to do that, well then again, it's very simple. Now let's say the first time I do this, I do input person 10 and then input divided by 10. The next time, what I'm gonna do is reversed equals reversed times 10 plus input person 10. 
So what reverse times 10 is gonna do is whatever you've added there before, you're just gonna push it out by one. So let's walk through this. Let's say I have five, four, three, two, one. This is my input. I'm gonna first do input, person 10, I'm gonna get one, and then I'm gonna do reversed times 10 plus one. Let's assume reverse start out being zero. So now reversed is going to be one. And then I'm going to do input, input divided by 10. All right, so now input is gonna be five, four, three, two. Now again, I'm gonna do reversed times 10 plus input with the remainder of what's divided by 10. Now I get two, which is this guy. I'm gonna do one times 10, so this is 10, and then I'm gonna add two, so this is gonna result in 12, and then I'm gonna do input equals input divided by 10. You guys see what's happening here? I'm basically using the divide by 10 operation to get one character, one digit by digit on the input. And then I'm doing the multiply by 10 operation to push the existing reversed value further and further up. So every time I add it, I'm not adding it directly. I'm basically creating that empty space by putting the zero there by multiplying by 10 and then adding it to the units place at all times. I want to mention there's one gotcha. Remember I told you there's one uh, potential trap with this approach. And when you're asked this in an interview, it's very likely that the interviewer would expect you to mention this particular trap. If you go with this approach, what is the drawback you see? What is the, what is the possibility when this could fail? When do we stop looping? We stop looping when input is a zero, right? So at any point of time, when you have, uh, let's say input gets down to just one digit, and then you do that one digit divided by 10, integer division, you end up with zero. So could stop there. Okay, I see a bunch of people who have uh, commented the right answer. You need to take care of the min and max values. What does that mean? Integer has a range, right? The Java virtual machine has a min limit and a max limit. So that's recorded as integer.min value and integer.max value. You cannot assign a value to an integer which exceeds the integer's max value. And you cannot assign a value to the integer which is lower than the integer's min value. Well, if you're doing integer operations, for the most part, you're gonna be within that range. But when you're doing something like this, when you're doing a reverse, you have to think, okay, is there a possibility that when I'm reversing an integer, I might go over the min val over the max value or lower than the min value? You might think, well, how is it possible? You're starting out with an integer, that's safe. So should or shouldn't a reverse be safe? Not entirely, because think of what's integer dot max value. I think two, it's two, one, four, blah, 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 blah. It's like a big number. Then you reverse it. Let's say that's your input string. You give it to your program, you reverse it, and you get back a value, which is integer's max value, all right? However, in, you take that value, and then you change the last digit by one, right? Instead of a two, you make it a three. It's still a valid integer when you start out with it, but then when you reverse it, it doesn't become 214 anymore, it's 314, which is clearly above the max value, right? So there's technically a possibility for you to start out with an integer which is within the limit, but then when you reverse it, it goes over the max value, and that wouldn't work. So you have to, you have to handle it, all right? So that's kind of like the, the only thing that you have to, um, only thing that you have to take care of, all right? So let's look at the code, and then this will make sense. It's basically the same approach with that one condition that you're gonna have to handle, all right? So here's how it's gonna go. All right, so here's my reverse method, which takes in an input as an argument, all right? This is your input integer. And now I'm going to hold on to the reversed, not as an integer, 
but as a long. Why do I do this? Long has a slightly bigger range. So you can technically not go over the bounds of long when you're starting out with an integer, but still you can work with a value which is technically beyond integer max value, all right? So long gives you like a bigger, bigger operating table for you to play around with this, reverse the integer. And what you can do is at the end of all this operation, you can check, okay, is this long value greater than the integer's max value or lower than the integer's min value, all right? Or you can actually do that for every operation, which I think you should. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop through you know, while loop, I'm gonna do this as long as input is greater than or equal to zero, all right? I'm gonna do reversed is reverse times 10 plus input divided by, you know, with the remainder of input divided by 10, all right? Which is basically the same pseudocode that we saw, all right? Input person 10 is gonna give you the last digit at all times, and then you're gonna add it to reverse times 10 so that you have whatever you have, and then you take that last value and append it to the end, all right? That's how you append with an integer, and then I divide input by 10 so that I take off that last digit from the input. Then I keep doing this till input is, while input is not equal to zero. Once input becomes zero, whatever is in reversed is the output. However, I also need to check if I've crossed the integer limits. So I have this if condition here, which says if it reversed is greater than the max value or less than the min value, I just return zero, all right? This is where you stop and ask the interviewer, all right, there is a possibility that this could exceed the max value or be lower than the min value, which is again, like I said, probably expected for this question. And then you should ask the interviewer, what should the return type be? Do you want me to throw an exception? Do you want me to return zero? Do you want me to return something else? Let's say the interviewer says zero, then you do this. If the interviewer says throw an exception, you throw an exception here, all right? So with this, you basically have uh, accounted for the out of range exceptions as well. Um, check using try catch. Try catch is one option. You can potentially have a try catch and then look for th this overflow errors. But the problem with depending on try catch is that your program becomes a little inefficient all right so when you're when you're writing code you use exceptions for exceptional situations that's the name exception right there that's going to give you a clue you don't want to depend on exceptions to handle your normal run of the mill validation or your or when you're expecting something to happen and then you're working around it all right. So when some, when you see that okay, I'm I'm going through a program flow where there are possibilities of A, B, and C happening, which could result in an error. Where you account for that, you put an if statement there. You account for that. Exception is only when okay something is wrong, and that's where you throw an exception. The reason you have this kind of distinction is because exception is resource intensive. If you are having the Java virtual machine throw exceptions, catch exceptions it takes some resource power for it to do that. So you don't wanna do that uh, expecting it to go wrong, right? So you do that when, you know, it's like, hopefully this will not happen, but if it happens, I just put that safety net in there. That's what exceptions are for, right? Not for handling business logic. And in this case, I would imagine the, the bounds are business logic.